Hey everybody. Uh, so this video is a set of um, general essay writing tips. Um, they're good for if any of the classes that I teach. So I'm teaching um, two sections of English 112. Those are my folks who are writing the most essays. So for you guys, these are like really useful. Uh, particularly as you head into the research essay and as you go through your revisions of the past couple of essays. Um, but the same set of, like, this, these are such general tips for essay writing that they also apply to my 099 students who are writing fewer essays, but you are writing essays, and to my English 231 students, my lit students, who are writing essays for the, for the end of the semester project. They are all pieces of like writing advice that I have collected over the years, uh, some of them from my college writing courses um, or my college English courses, but they've been useful to me like in the academic context, sure, but they've also been useful to me in all kinds of um, communicative contexts throughout my career, right? So um, this is less about, okay, these are the things that I'm looking for on the assignment and I'm going to mark off so many points if you don't do X, Y, Z. And much more about like these are strategies um, and things to watch for in your own writing that you know like you put these in a file somewhere or you like write them down next to your you know keyboard or whatever and keeping these things in mind will make you a better writer a stronger writer uh, and in a couple of cases because I have like some, like some uh, commonly misplaced punctuation tips, um, they'll make you a writer who spends less time looking up the right way to punctuate a sentence. So, uh, the very first of these, oh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear it, there are apparently a lot of um, emergency vehicles outside. I'm a little concerned. Um, so the first one of these is anytime you say research shows or some scholars think or a common argument is or many people may believe or whatever, like you're making a claim that somebody out there has discovered something or said something or thought something or made a claim, you're saying that, like you're referencing that this other stuff exists out there in the world somewhere, you have to show us at least one example of that actually existing in the world, okay? You cannot say research shows that and then not tell it, not show us an example of the research, right? So you can't say um, research shows that college English professors drink more tea than college history professors and then not cite a study. Like if you tell us that, you have to show us the data, right? Like you can't just tell us that it exists and go on. Um, if you say some scholars think that the Beowulf text may have been the product of multiple scribes, you have to show us a scholar who has said that, right? Like, quote the passage in which somebody says, the Beowulf text may have been the result of work by multiple scribes. You have to show us at least one example of that actually existing in the world. You can't just throw it out there and assume that we will agree with you. It's a thing that exists. Like, no, don't do that. Um, so whatever the thing that you're talking about is, that you say exists, you have to show us at least one example of it existing. Um, if you're in a literature course, mine or any other one, you know, because everybody takes at least one lit, if you say that, if you make a claim about something happening in a text, right, like if you say, um, throughout the Iliad, Achilles demonstrates a hot temper, you have to actually show us an example of Achilles losing his cool, <laughs> and blowing up at somebody, right? At least one time. You can't just say that it's a thing that happens in the Iliad and go on. You have to give an example. If, same deal with, like, if you say that scholars have found or critics say or whatever, you've got to give an example of the thing. In a lot of contexts, you might want more than one example, but you have to give us at least one of whatever you say is existing. Um, so then... I keep reading sentences that say, there was a study that was done. First of all, studies aren't done, they're conducted, or designed, or deployed. I like conducted. They're not done. Conducted. Secondly, you know, like, okay, so that's the thing about, like, word choice. But secondly, is the fact that a study was conducted actually the important piece of information you want to convey? Like, is the existence of this study, the fact that somebody 
made a research plan and went out and you know surveyed some folks or they collected soil samples or what is that actually the important piece of information or are you interested in what they found out in their study because if it's the latter because sometimes you actually do want to talk about how studies get designed and who make who participates in them and that kind of stuff sometimes that actually is an important part of your argument but way more often the actual thing that you're going to tell us like the thing that you are here to discuss is what the study found and in that case you don't need to lead in with there was a study that was conducted you can go straight to researchers researchers at the university of wherever uh, analyzed soil samples from this place and found that earthworms were crawling faster or whatever right whatever random thing but you can skip straight to yeah, you can skip straight to telling us what the study actually found. You don't have to tell us that it was conducted. We will get the fact that a study was conducted when you start telling us about its results. Okay? If you start telling us, like, researchers found, blah, 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 we will get the idea that at some point they must have studied that. We will. Um, don't trust your reader too much, but we'll get that far, right? So skip straight to, like, the thing that you're actually, like, the piece of information that you are actually going to discuss. Don't lead in by telling us that it was the product of research we're gonna get that part um then this kind of ties it like this is sort of like a less about the way that you introduce studies and more about the way that you introduce the next piece of your own argument don't tell us my next point is <laughs> We don't need to know that it's your next point. We just need to know what the point is. Just go ahead and tell us. Okay. Um, really often I'm reading through a student essay and like I get to the end of a paragraph and then topic sentence of the next paragraph instead of telling the topic of that paragraph says my next topic is blah blah blah. Then tell us it's your next topic. Just give us the info. Give us the information. We don't need to know that it's next for you. And that's especially true because, like, after you go through a few drafts, you start to forget the order in which you place things. And a lot of times I'll end up reading, uh, like, I'll be halfway through an essay, and I'll get to a paragraph that starts, Lastly, and we haven't had any previous items in the list, okay, so the rest of the paragraphs are not organized in a list, so it can't be the last one of, you know, like, a list that doesn't exist and also it's in the middle of the essay why are, we just, why are we on the last one if we are like we've still got half an essay to go it doesn't make good sense so don't enumerate for us where you are in your series of points don't narrate your process as a writer on the page walk us through the argument itself not you know your experience of putting the ideas together and that kind of stuff and unless the order of discussion is like super critical and people need to understand that this has to come first and this comes second unless that is really critical and you are step like explaining your way through a multi-step process probably don't remind us at the beginning of each paragraph where we are in that process okay way most often the order of your paragraphs is not what you need to signal to us rather you need to signal the logical logical connection between the concepts you're discussing not the um ordering of paragraphs as such right like it's about the ideas in the paragraphs not the sequencing of your paragraphs um i could belabor that point a little bit more i won't i'll keep moving um related to that and sort of organizing and you know putting pieces together there are a number of ways to go about structuring the relationship between your work like the ideas that you are putting on the page and the work that you are citing whether that's in an english 112 research essay or in an english 231 textual analysis either one of those you're going to be citing materials from other people in the 112 course it's probably going to be scholarly articles about something happening in the world right that relates to your research topic whatever that is if it's a 231 paper, you might have scholarly articles on the same text that you are also discussing, but you're also clearly going to be discussing, like, citing from the text that you're discussing, right? So if it's Beowulf, you're going to have quotes from Beowulf, and you may also have scholars who are 
similarly talking about Beowulf, but you're going to have examples of textual material from the thing that you're looking at. In either of those cases, like 112, 231, any context in which you are citing somebody else's words and ideas, you have to like put that into dialogue with your original material and like what you have to say about this stuff. The first thing is like, the first thing to know here is quotes don't speak for themselves ever. So like you've got a quote, you got to introduce it some kind of a way. You also have to, having put the quote on the page, then tell us what it's doing there. Okay, you have to tell us what it demonstrates and how, right? What does this, what does this prove? Why am I, why am I seeing this quote? Um, if it's from a scholarly article and it's like providing data, you tell us what that data shows, you know, in, in the terms of your thesis statement, right? Like what piece of, how does it support the thesis statement? Um, sometimes it supports the thesis statement because it proves that one of your supporting points is valid and accurate and your supporting point in supporting point in turn supports the thesis statement, right? So sometimes it's like a step step process. But still, there's some kind of relationship between the information that you just quoted and the topic that we're discussing. If it's a literary analysis paper, uh, you may have made a claim about, you know, how to understand a character or the opera operational definition of hero that appear that's like implied in a text. You give us a quote, you have to show us, like you have to explain how the quote that you just gave us demonstrates what you're saying the text does, okay? Um, as long as we're talking about quotes, this is a, like, this trips people up a lot, so I want to kind of, like, call it out. If you are quoting material and you don't have an in-text reference for whatever reason, uh, first of all, that happens rarely, but it could be, like, if you are putting scare quotes around, like, like, if you are saying a common way of formulating blah 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 is students are lazy, right? Like if I put it in quotation marks, students are lazy and I'm saying like, it's not always said exactly like this, but this is the idea that is encapsulated, right? Like this is, I see this a lot. And I put it at the end of a sentence, then I wouldn't have an in-text citation necessarily, right? Like I'm saying, I think people think this. Um, if you're writing di a line of dialogue even, which in research writing, like in essay writing, rarely ever happens. But if you did, this is how you'd format it. So you got the quoted material, you got the period or the comma or the whatever, and you got the quotation marks afterwards. Way more common, if you have um, an in-text citation after the quote, these are the ways that you might go about organizing that. So you got your quoted material, you got quotation marks, you got the in-text reference, and then you have the period at the very end. Um, if you've got, if the quoted material is in the middle of one of your sentences, you've got stuff over here, like you're writing, you're writing, you're writing, you quote some stuff, you end the quote, you keep writing, you finish out your sentence, you put the in-text citation, and then at the end of that, you put your period. Um, quotation marks go after, so like on the outside of commas and periods. They go inside, so you put the punctuation after the quotation mark, uh, with colons and semicolons. So let me say that again. I'll show you. I'll, I'll try to show you. It may not be the same thing. Colon and semicolon punctuation, like the quotation mark is inside the punctuation. For the commas and the periods, it's the other way around. See? Okay. We'll do more of all of this, um, particularly as we work on the formatting for MLA style for the 112 folks. But if you are in any of the other classes and you have questions, let me know. Um, really, really, really stop saying studies have been done. Research has been conducted and the fact that it's been conducted is probably not the point. Okay, that's it for tonight. Take care, everybody.